Hello everyone, this is Piero San Giorgio. Today I'm, uh, I'm really happy to have Ingrid Kalkist. Is it uh, the right way to pronounce it? Yeah, very good. Perfect. Well, uh, welcome to my little uh, YouTube channel. We have about 40,000 uh, mostly French, but most of them speak English speakers, mm -hmm. and the vast majority of them have no idea uh, about what's happening in Sweden. And this is what I'd like to talk to you today. Um, as, as I said just before, uh, first of all, I'll introduce you, uh, you know, you're a journalist, a uh, veteran journalist out of, in Sweden. You've worked for many, um, many Swedish publications, also with international, like Fox News. And, um, and you're also an author with a, with a book out in Sweden. Um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it in Swedish properly. Uh, no, but uh, you can say it in English, but it's not av available yet. But uh, From Sweden to Absurdistan is the title. And I'm working on having it translated into English. Because I think, you know, because this is a story about how Sweden became, how did we go from normal, yes. happy, safe Sweden to this multicultural chaos that I call absurdistan because it's a totally absurd country and it, it has changed during my lifetime and I think this is not only Sweden I think that lots of European countries have gone through the same process maybe not as deep as we have but that's why I want people to be able to read it outside of Sweden So I know Sweden for having worked there Having, uh, I used to go to, to Göteborg for a girlfriend long, long, like 20 years ago. But I also worked with um, selling software into Saab, into and into companies uh, in uh, in um, in, uh, in the capital in in Stockholm. And uh, and of course, one of my best friends' father was the CEO of uh, uh, maybe you know Swedish Match, which was sold to mm -hmm. Concordia. And um, so I knew Sweden a little bit from from the time, and it was a country of very polite. Very nice, hardworking people, perhaps a little bit too much socialist for me, but it was working. Mm -hmm. And the last few years, I've not been in Sweden for maybe maybe ten years, and we hear horror stories. So indeed, your book probably tells the story. Can you tell us to, to our audience what what has happened? Yeah, what has happened is that uh, the politicians decided already in 1975, behind the back of the people, that Sweden was not going to be a Swedish country anymore, but a multicultural one. And I do think that most of them, the parliament members didn't really understand what that would mean because Sweden was one of the most homogenous countries in the world especially in Europe, we were so homogenous. We had only 1% foreign born when I was a child. So I think those members of the parliament, they couldn't really see what this would mean. I mean, you know, Swedes, we are a bit special, you know. It's like this. Uh, I have many Danish friends, and they always say to me, why are you not nationalist in Sweden? And I say, well, we are, but you know, we know that we are the best country in the world and when you are the best you must not brag because that is unpolite so most Swedes they thought that well we are always going to be Swedish and Sweden is the best country in the world so what do we care if some people come here they will want to become just like us and so it was for many years when we had you know uh, uh, immigrants from Greece, former Yugoslavia, Italy, and so on. They came here to work in the sixties and seventies, and that worked very fine. They they didn't become Swedish, but their children became Swedish. But what happened in the eighties and the nineties was that we had this mass immigration of asylum seekers from the Middle East and Africa, but the Swedes still worked in the concept that everybody would like to become like we because we are the best in the world. And we are so nice and we are so polite, just as you say, and hardworking. So what happens when you have a lot of people coming into a country with hardworking, nice people, and you have people from countries where they don't trust the state, the Swedes trust too much in the state. And so they come here and they see that we are gullible. They can say 
anything. They can lie and they can just get money and money and money from us. So that's clash. And what's happened because of this is that we are losing because we are still polite and nice and we don't want to, to fight with people. And we can't. all these people came in and they just want to take over. They don't love Sweden. They that don't love the Swedish people. They just want our money. And most of the Muslims want to take over and make Sweden a Sharia state. Hmm. The, um, the interesting part you mentioned is that it started a long time ago, in 1975, so that's even before I was born. And uh, No, actually, that's, uh, that's after I was born. I'm so old. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, but definitely, um, when um, all the Swedish people I know don't know about that. They, they, no. they understand this is a very recent phenomenon. So what is the ideology that started it? What, what's the, who are the people behind that? I mean, ideolo ideologically speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say it was uh, uh, Olof Palme, you know, the social democratic prime minister that was murdered. Before him, the, uh, there was a um, uh, another social democratic prime minister, Tage Erlando, and he said in 1964, I think, he said that Um, when there had been race riots uh, in America, he said that we in Sweden, we are in a, so, in a so much more happy situation because our country is homogenous, not only according to the race. I think he meant that we had the same values, the same view of things and so on. And then 1968, Olaf Palme became the prime minister and he was not the old school social democrat. He was a he was from a, a very rich family, sort of nobility from um, the Baltic states. I don't remember which one. And his family was very international and he had studied abroad and he 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 liked the international idea so and then there was a, a a debate in some swedish newspapers there was this a guy called david schwartz he had been in a concentration camp in poland he was a polish jew and he came to sweden um a few years after World War II finished, and he started to work for uh, minorities and for multiculturalism. And he got the ear of Olaf Palme, and so they started this project. So, I mean, only 10 years after the old prime minister said that we are so lucky that we are such a homogenous country, they decided that Sweden was not going to be Swedish anymore. And rightly, as you say, most Swedes have no idea. There was no debate in 1975. Nobody knew about it because I think no one could ever understand. Maybe David Schwartz knew what would happen, but I don't think, you know, the normal MP had any idea how this would change Sweden. Now, Sweden um, has, um, uh, and, and very few people know this ex out of Sweden, but has a very long uh, history of, um, I, I, should, I should not call it imperialism inside Europe, but uh, a, very, a very strong history of being a powerful country, mm -hmm. uh, having influences in Germany, of course in the Baltics, or, and fighting all the way into Russia. And, and before that, of course, everyone knows the Vikings, but, uh, which were mostly traders, but um, strong traders traveling all across, all the way to, the, to Baghdad and, and to, to Byzantium, to Constantinople, and to and all over the world, going to North America. And, um, and so we have this image, or actually, actually history proves that Swedish has these very powerful people, strong farmers uh, um, that have been uh, uh, um, ironed into the winter and, and difficult climate and have, and have become uh, traders, uh, warriors, fighters. And, and, and suddenly, after, I think the last war was uh, with, with Napoleon, right? With when you had the Count mm -hmm. Bernadotte becoming emperor, uh, king. Um, suddenly, it was peace. So two centuries of peace have, yeah. tur it seems, uh, have turned Sweden in a completely different um, approach, and which was making the good in the world. And, and I worked in Africa. I've seen a lot of Swedish uh, investments, uh, I mean, ONGs working to cr make water and schools in in, in In, in villages and so on. So it has been a, a sort of um, a peace power powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And now 
um, 19, 2019, for the last 10 years, we start to see crime growing up, rape growing up, something that was unheard of yeah. in Sweden. I remember mm -hmm. going in Gothenburg, maybe you know the area, Vastra Frölunda, yeah. um, and it was a poor area, and it was safe 20 years ago. You could go out, uh, mm -hmm. women were in miniskirts, no problem. I wonder oh. how it has changed. Certainly Malmo has changed. Yeah, I lived in Malmo for 25 years and I moved, I left Malmo like five years ago and it was the best thing I've ever done. Unfortunately, most Swedish cities are becoming like Malmo in these days. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that Sweden used to be a superpower because I think that is part of the problem. Uh, we still have sort of the self-image of ourselves as a superpower. And now that we cannot or don't want to be a military superpower, that's why we went into this humanitarian superpower mode. And, and you, you can say, well, that's the politicians. Yeah, but it worked because Swedes still see themselves as being part of a superpower. So now we can still be you know, famous all over the world because we are we are the country that takes in the most refugees and even though it doesn't work in other countries, we will make it work because we are the best social engineers in the world and so on. So that's, I think, is part of the problem that Swedes have been keeping quiet for such a long time because we were all thinking, well, this is Sweden. Nothing can happen to Sweden. We are the best country in the world. It, I, I hope you understand that I'm joking no, no, when I, I say that. But I think it's part of the self-image. So it's been so difficult for normal Swedes to understand, no, we are not the best country in the world anymore. We used to have 1% foreign-born. Now we have 30% of the population have some kind of foreign background. It's totally changed. And you see it when you go downtown. I mean, as you say, you, you can't see any girls in miniskirts anymore. It's, it's out of the question. When I go downtown to my uh, uh, city, I see mostly Muslim Muslim women and men. The Swedes are staying indoors. They take their car everywhere because it's not safe to go with a bus or with a train or so on. So, I mean, it's totally changed us. And now Swedes are starting to wake up and say, oh my God, what happened? And my fear I do think it's a good thing that Swedes are finally waking up and starting to protest. But my fear is that many Swedes will say it's lost. The minute they wake up and really face the truth, they will say it's lost. My country is lost. I can't bring up my children here. I need to, to flee this country because... And I do understand, especially people who have young children, that they don't feel safe here. But if we all leave then we are lost. There will be no more Swedes, not in Sweden anymore. I relate to what you say, being Swiss. Switzerland has the same uh, approach that you have in Sweden, less the good looks but um, <laughs> of the people. But certainly, certainly, uh, I've, I've, I've heard recently that I, perhaps you can correct me um, because I'm not sure of the who was the, the minister. Was it Minister of Interior who said, uh, we cannot change, we cannot stop the process of mass immigration because if we do anything, it will lead to civil war. And and this is like, okay, so then you are defeated if you, if you think like yeah. that. Yeah. And um, and the other, another remark in which you, you probably would like to comment is when, when I go on holidays and I meet Swedish people, whether on the ski resorts in Switzerland, you meet, you meet rich Swedish people or, or mm. when you go in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sun resorts and, and so on. When I talk to them, because I'm I'm I like, I'm a naughty boy, I told I tell them, I I, I gave them, I ask them questions about about Sweden. They all say, oh no 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 no, everything is fine. And of course, these bourgeois class, these rich Swedes people, mm -hmm. at least they say that everything is fine. How do you see this disconnect? Well, I think they have uh, they have no idea. Hmm. You know, when the Sweden Democrats, the more populist party, the party who doesn't want any more uh, uh, immigration. When they started to grow, I mean, they came into parliament in 2010. Uh, when they started to grow, they said that, oh, it's just uneducated people, you know, living in the countryside. Well, that that might have been true. But why? Because those were the first people who 
who engaged with these foreigners and knew what their thing was about. And But now what has happened the last one or two years is that even now they go into the middle class, even the upper class areas and rob little children with knives and they rape women. So now these people who you have, whom you have met on the ski resorts, they are not so cocky anymore because they too are experiencing this. Hmm. Now, in your book, I, you have statistics and data on the criminality. Can you give us some of the most uh, impressive, or, or, or the, the, some of, so that the people that are listening to us and don't know Sweden can realize how bad it is these days? Yeah, I checked those numbers a few years ago, and uh, you know the funny thing is that our crime statistics they start in 1975, exactly the year that the parliament decided we were going to be multicultural, and at that point we had like 300 reported rapes every year, and now it's like 8,000. Wow. So that gives you kind of a notion of what is going on. And But when you speak to Swedish politicians, they say, oh, it's because we changed the law, so more things are considered rape, and, and women are more brave these days. No, no, just forget it. It is a, like, 2,000% uh, increase. Uh, so that is one very big thing. And then we have all the shootings, the gang criminals, they are shooting each other. They are uh, exploding things. You know, there, there are so many bombs going off in Sweden. It's like worse than in the mafia places in Italy and in Mexico. It's mm -hmm. more than that. Uh, and but then they always say, "Well, but the the uh, the deaths, the murders, they are a constant." They have even dropped a little bit since 1975. Well, I can tell you wh why that is. And I'm sure it's the same in all Western countries. It is because we all have mobile phones now. So when we see someone being stabbed or shot, many people just call the ambulance right away. So they get into hospitals. And then the other thing is that the doctors who ne had never treated any sh anyone shot in 1975 now they have become very skilled yeah so that's the reason and so if you take in these figures the um the ones that tried to murder someone then you will see a big increase but people dead it's sort of the same now with such an increase of problems one would assume that the media would talk about it right <laughs> yeah you would assume. Why do you think I quit the mainstream media 10 years ago? Because I was so fed up with the lies. And you cannot ever change anything or deal with the problems if you don't speak the truth. And as a journalist, I think that that is my most important work to, 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 to speak the truth, to tell people. But journalists, I think, I don't know if it's only in Sweden or if it's all over the world. Journalists, they think of themselves as demigods. They can know everything. They can know that gypsies are almost the only ones who rob old people. But if we tell it to to the, the ordinary people, they would go crazy. They would go out and kill the gypsies. Uh, no, that would not happen, especially not in Sweden. You know, mm. you know us, you know, we are, we are not like that. We are not violent. So, um, um, not yet. The journalists. Not yet, no. There might come a point when the Vikings come back. I, I do pray for that day. <laughs> but the, the problem is that the, the Swedish journalists, they are not anymore scrutinizing the powers for the people. They are working for the powers, trying to tell people how to think, what they can know and what they can discuss and what they must not talk about. So that's a big problem. And But we have seen in the last uh, couple of months... Not many, but some journalists, like a handful or two handfuls, coming over to my side, sort of, uh, you know, writing columns about we have to do something. I mean, this gang criminality that we have, all the rapes and so on, it's not, we cannot allow this mass immigration to go on. So I, I think that uh, things are starting to change, but will it be in time? 
I don't know. We don't have election until three years. So and a lot of things can happen in three years. Now, of course, uh, one of the risks in such a scenario, in such high criminality conditions, is that sooner or later, or perhaps not with the Swedish culture, I'm not sure, uh, sooner or later someone takes personal revenge. Um, is, is at least the judicial system able to catch and, and condemn the rapist, for example? No. Okay. No, 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 no. Very so, few of them. Just a couple of percent so are being is, caught and, you know, sent to prison. And we have this other problem with a foreign rapist. Normally, a, a sound country would kick them out. Mm -hmm. If you are a foreign citizen and you rape people in Sweden, you, you go to jail and then you are extradited from this country. No, four out of five foreign rapists are allowed to stay in Sweden. Now, when, um, so it's yeah. almost like our government, the police, the judicial system, everybody... They want the Swedes to become, you know, extinct. Mm -hmm. Now, when when um, these foreign uh, criminals become Swedes, because I presume you also have naturalization uh, yep. uh, levels, is the media obviously saying, oh, it's Sweden, Swedish people committing these crimes? Of course. You know, we have all these ISIS terrorists. Uh, and they all talk about them as Swedish. A Swedish mm -hmm. man was captured in the Philippines. A Swede, two uh, Swedes raped someone in Oslo, for example, and so on. But nowadays, everyone knows that it's Swedes. Okay. Yeah. So because we have a great alternative media scene uh, in okay. Sweden. Of course, since all the mainstream media are so lying and so deceitful, the, there are so many alternative media uh, um, outlets who are doing a great job. As, as, as I'm not a Swedish speaker, I can only listen to people like Angry Foreigner or people like that. And um, so, so tell us a bit about how, how that alternative media has spawned has been created and, 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 is, and is spreading. Is it more to the young people, to the older people, or everyone? How is it working? I do think that nowadays, uh, even the so-called boomers <laughs> listen to and, and read these uh, sites. Um, and I think it's because, because there was a need in Sweden, because it, there was a, this anger that people said, why are they calling them Swedes? What is happening? I want to know. So someone started one alternative news site, and then another one came, and another one. And now we have like, I don't know, 10 or 15 good alternative media sites uh, with the news and columns and uh, podcasts, op-eds. So people are really... They really need this, and but you know they are still very afraid to to recommend it to others, to share it mm -hmm. on Facebook because maybe someone will see someone at your job or your family. So that's a that's a problem. Now, with uh, you mentioned, the, what is the percentage of um, of Swedish and citizens who are not Swedish born or or are not Swedish ancestry? I don't know if they are citizens, but of the people living. Mm -hmm. Uh, here, 30% have some kind of foreign background. They might be born in Sweden, but okay. to two Muslim parents, okay. so to speak. So they don't speak good Swedish, they don't have uh, uh, Swedish values and norms and so on. So 30%, from 1% foreign born to 30%, it's a huge change. And that's what I write in my book too, that I once talked to a Danish politician uh and he said to me, and it was like an epiphany for me when he said it, and I, and I write about this in my book, he said that no politician, he was conservative, and he said to me, no politician has the right to change the country, their country, totally in one generation. And, you, and, yeah. and it's so true. They don't have the right... And he said, not even if the people would like you to do it. You, as a politician, have an obligation to say, no, we have this country, we have these traditions and norms, we can't just change everything and change the population from Swedes to Muslims and Africans. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the issue is that you add one more generation and with, uh, I presume, um, well, of course, um, 
the people from the Middle East and Africa have more children than the Swedes, uh, you add one generation and then you have almost 50%, for sure, uh, yeah, of, yeah. Of, of foreigners which can vote. Now, yeah. then the, the question is, if you can never go take back your country in a demogra- democratic way because the, 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 the mathematics will not uh, happen, then what? You have the country splitting or you have civil war or what? what what's your scenario uh, in worst case scenario? My, yeah, my, my best case scenario is that in the next election in 2022, we, the Sweden Democrats will be the biggest party and the new, even more um, radical party uh, will come into the parliament and, and will start repatriation because that is the peaceful solution First, you get rid of all the criminals and then all the people who just live off welfare and who don't speak Swedish and, and, you know, never, never was a part of our society. And then you can also give people money to leave, because I assure you, lots of these foreigners that live in Sweden, they hate it. They are only here because of the money and the free living and the free schools, free well, not maybe education, because not many of them get educated. But, you know, all the free stuff. So if, if I, don't know, I don't know how much money, but let's say they got like um, 10 or 20,000 euros to go back to their country and to leave back their passport and sign a paper, you can never, ever enter Sweden again. Then that would be a mm-hmm. win for us. Because even if we had to lower our standards, we would save the Swedish people, and that is everything that you know matters. Of course, because money you can you can be without money, you can become poorer for a decade or two. But so long as we still have the Swedish people in a powerful majority in Sweden, we will survive. One one element that perhaps even the foreigners may not understand properly is that. Uh, there's a lot of studies, especially in, in Britain, but also in, Amer- in, North, in, in the northern parts of the United States, that show that after, after a generation, people who have um, dark skin, and it's not a question of being good or bad, it's just a, mm. an adaptation to, to their country where they are from originally, uh, because, of this, uh, the lack of, because of the lack of sunlight of Nordic, Nordic uh, um, geographies, Mm-hmm. They don't process, there's not enough life for them to process vitamin D. And yeah. we start to see after one generation, huge cases of cancers, of, of bone density decreasing, and, and you have weaker and weaker generations. So um, the adaptation is very difficult to do, and, 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 and it's also, there is also a medical problem that will start mm-hmm. to happen. Maybe in, in the case of Sweden, it's too soon because it's, it's recent. But this is something that is happening in the UK with people from Jamaica who moved in the 1950s. The grandsons of these people are starting to have really deep medical problems. Anyway, yeah. now, we do see it in the Somalis. We have a lot of Somalis yeah. hit here. And their, their kids, they have vitamin D uh, right, of course. Uh, problems and they have these um, autism problems. We don't know if it has anything to do with that but it's it's remarkable that so many yeah. somali children have autism yeah now um recently well a few years back the um, the swedish government issued a, a booklet to this population asking them to prepare for war yeah um i myself am a, you know, i'm an author of best-selling books about survival and how you prepare to civil wars and 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 catastrophes and things like that now, when a government gives out this kind of, of, of booklets, this is not innocent. This is not without an idea behind the back. Uh, is it because it's part of the anti-Russia, anti-Putin bashing, or there is more behind that? I guess there is more behind it, but they, they hide um, behind the Russian threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think they do it because they want to be able to say to the Swedes, when the civil war is here, but we told you. We told you to prepare. It's not our fault. Because I do think that many of them, they they understand that they have created havoc. And they just had uh, these discussions now, the government and the opposition parties, how to solve the gang criminality. 
And they are like, they, you know, it's just stupid stuff. They don't understand that you have to be, you have to have visitation zones. You have to let the police go and just stop people and say, we want to search your pockets. We want to search your bag. No, we can't do that in Sweden because that would be not good for their integrity and so on. So they are, they are newly awake. They don't know what to do, but they fear I'm sure, deep inside, I don't think they sleep very well because they do realize that there is, it's like a big bomb just waiting to mm. get off. Go now, on. if you if you had um, an, for I'm sure, I presume there's going to be millions of uh, of Swedish people listening to this video, if you could tell an advice to to Swedish people, because here's here's a scenario. You you say elections of 2022, and then it takes some time in the best case scenario, for laws to be taken. Now, if in the meantime, you have an oil crisis, you have a financial meltdown of an international mm-hmm. finance, and then suddenly governments don't have the money to pay the people. Yeah. In France, in England, in, in mm-hmm. Belgium, in Sweden. You know, this can turn very ugly in the streets today because then the people who might want to leave because there's no handouts anymore, they cannot leave because there's no money to leave. So then, then, then this is a this is a very dangerous situation. Um, besides voting for the right in the right way uh, in 2022, what would be your advice for Swedish people who listen to us? Well, I think the best advice would be to prepare. Try not to to have debts, uh, but a lot of Swedes they do have because they the only way to get a house these days is to buy one and uh, people don't have money because we pay so much in tax you know we give away all our money to the government so they have to go to the banks and they have huge loans really really bad try if you can to sell that pay your debts and try to move into the countryside try to live a little more not so luxurious but you know and uh, grow your own uh, food if it's possible and uh, prepare because there will be really bad times i'm sure of that have you read my book yet no but uh, this is exactly (laughs) what my first book uh, tells people to do (laughs) okay very good yeah you must come to sweden and give lectures about this i would love to do that in fact yeah uh, i have a few invitations going around maybe in 2020 um, yeah. Maybe we, before we go now, for for people who don't live in Sweden and who would like, like me, to co- to come or to come back to Sweden, um, what advice would you give them as a tu- as tourists in Sweden? Who, uh, you know, they they tell us that tourism tourism is going so well in Sweden, but my I think it's because Swedes don't have money to go abroad, so they tourist in their own country. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's not dangerous in that way. If you want to go to Stockholm, if you go the, the northern part of Sweden to walk in the uh, mountains and so on, it, it's safe. I mean, it's not like uh, going to Baghdad or something like that, but it's not like it used to be and you have to be a bit careful and don't uh, you know walk around flashing a rolex uh, watch or something like that you you have to be careful mm-hmm. because sweden is not what it used to be and try to find some swedes to to associate with and they can help you show you where it's safe well that's uh, that's good advice i believe uh, don't leave. I have something to tell you after we cut, but uh, I thank you very much for for your time, and um, I'll put the link to your website in the description of the of the video. And of course, um, you know, we, we hey, maybe it's a good idea to have a conference in in Stockholm. Yeah, why not? Excellent. Take care and thank you very much. Thank you, Piero. Bye bye.